Okay, I hope everyone can see me. Uh, welcome everyone. Garrett Presh, uh, founder of the World Health Innovation Summit. Absolutely delighted to welcome you to our session today on the impact of COVID-19, public health control on SDG implementation process. I'm going to be joined with colleagues from around the world where some of our um, speakers are joining us uh, from Australia, from the UK, uh, from Africa. We've had a few um, uh, a few of our speakers have had to drop out due to work commitments today, um, but we're very much looking forward to hosting you. And if you have any questions throughout the sessions, please do raise your hand and we'll take those questions once the speaker is finished. Um, we want to give an insight into the opportunities that COVID-19 has also created in terms of uh, looking at the future of healthcare. I'm going to join, uh, start by just inviting um, Dr. Nasibu Mawanda to give us an introduction and then move to James Sanderson from NHS England and the, National Acad the CEO of the National Academy of Social Prescribing to do a short introduction. And then we'll get into some presentations around the Global Social Prescribing Alliance and also from Tueda, which is the Tanzanian dysphoria, um, on how they're supporting Africa during COVID-19. We'll take around the questions about the SDG implementation, which is good health and well-being. But let's start and meet some of the panelists. Um, Dr. Nazibu Mwande, uh, you're very welcome to, to the session and um, delighted you can join us today. All right. Thank you very much, Gareth. And uh, I'm so delighted to be here with uh, everyone, actually. Uh, OK, like Gareth said, my name is Nasibu Mwande. I'm originally from Tanzania. And uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician uh, with the North Cumbria Integrated Care NHS Trust. And uh, at the same time, I'm the vice chairman of um, the Tanzania UK Healthcare Diaspora Association, which uh, basically is uh, all the people from Tanzania who are interested in healthcare matters. You don't have to be a doctor or a nurse, but as long as you are you interested in, um, in healthcare, uh, and well being for that matter, and uh, you are happy to, to join. And uh, you can be from Tanzania or not, but we are a very uh, good organization. We're quite young, and uh, we we are learning on the go as well. And we still have done quite a lot of things uh, so far. So that's that's me briefly. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, um, Dr. Moanda. Um, and we'll get into the role of Tuaid and the work that you do to support Africa very shortly. Um, delighted to welcome the CEO of the National Academy of Social Prescribing, my colleague who works with us on the Global Social Prescribing Alliance, uh, James Sanderson. James, um, an introduction to, to everyone who's joining us. Thank you very much, Gareth. I'm really delighted um, to be here um, this afternoon. And um, great to get into the opportunity of um, discussing some new innovations in healthcare and how we meet the challenges of the sustainable development goals that we all want to achieve. So I'm um, James Sanderson, as Gareth said, I'm the new CEO of the National Academy for Social Prescribing, which has recently been set up by the UK government. And I'm also director of uh, personalised care for the NHS um, in England and also director of palliative and end of life care. So I'm um, looking forward to talking to you all a bit more um, about social prescribing very soon. Thanks, James. And as I said, if anyone has any questions while we go through the sessions, please do pop your hand up and we'll take those questions through Q&A. Um, let us go back to uh, Dr. Mwande and uh, start with his presentation around the work of Tuaida. Um, Naz, over to you. And we, we're looking forward to hearing how we can support um, Africa and the wider community through good health and well-being, SDG3. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. Um, let's get to hear that, like I said, for the Tanzania UK Healthcare Diaspora Association. Um, we, our main objective is mainly to have the best of both worlds, because we are from Tanzania, we are, and uh, we, most of, of us, we work in the United Kingdom. Now, the main aim for, when we're in the UK, we have more, uh, more advantage than our colleagues back in Tanzania. So what we're trying to do is to share those experiences because they, it, to have a two-way learning uh, and encounter. So we support our colleagues uh, in Tanzania in skills uh, and knowledge uh, building. And that is the main uh, objective to start with. And uh, 
along with that, we just have uh, working together with the government to find uh, ways of helping them uh, to build capacity. Because I think uh, we work there, most of us who work in Tanzania, we know where the challenges are. And working in the UK, we can see how things are done in here. So, and we can translate those uh, uh, into uh, our community in Tanzania in a way. I know we can, those are two different environments, but I think try to build on the strength of the people on the ground in Tanzania and so make some small adjustment uh, according to their capability. It'd be a better way than us imposing something. Okay, this from the UK have it in Tanzania. It won't work like that. So we just we we have we try to get a level playing field where we can all find solutions uh, to our problems uh, uh, in a, a very uh, fair and a equal manner. Uh, at the same time, as well with a bit of the technology, we we try to uh, if we can source some uh, because the um, things like diagnostic and the equipment and and the working tools for healthcare, and then what we're trying to do, because uh, here sometimes with change of technology, stuff get you know checked away, for example. I mean, be thrown away while they're still actually working, and why someone in the rural Tanzania, for example, they don't have the system. So we try to find something that is useful. I mean, it may be old, but still useful, and it can help to save lives. So we try to, to find this kind of, uh, uh, equipment solely for uh, our colleagues on the ground as well. But one of our main projects that we have done, because we are main on skills building, we have um, established a simulation, medical simulation center at Tumbi Hospital in Tanzania, where we can train people, uh, or people can train and learn on a high fidelity mannequin instead of learning on, on human beings, which is where they, the traditional way. So you can go to the simulation room, yeah, train your people, and learn, make as many mistakes as possible. And then when you go to see the actual patient, you can, you know, you, you have refined your, your art. And that's the main thing, uh, which uh, we, we have achieved. And then we have another project, uh, with the same simulation data, with Tuzans as well. And uh, because of COVID, we have not much to take that off the ground. But we still have the kit. Uh, we just have to find the, the funding to transfer the kids to uh, set up in, uh, um, in, in Zanzibar. And then, so during the time of COVID, because we don't have much face-to-face, -face, we made good use of the technology. So we have done quite a lot of webinars uh, for the community and for our healthcare colleagues as well to share experiences, see what we're doing here, and what they, they're doing there. So we just, uh, and we find that what they did there, some of the stuff we tried here, uh, maybe I'd be at a community or individual level and sometimes when, uh, in, in our work environment. So it, that collaboration is very, very important. And that's what to help is built on, that collaboration and partnership, because we believe that is the future uh, uh, of healthcare and, uh, and the well-being. So in short, uh, that uh, I can say the record to header um, in brief. But uh, if anyone got any question, they can just, uh, I'm here. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Hi, uh, thanks, Dr. Mwanda. Um, it will be great to get some questions. And also, uh, could you give us a bit of an insight into what it's like on the ground at the moment in Tanzania in terms of the impact of COVID-19? I mean, worldwide, we've seen, you know, we're almost at 4 million deaths. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, I think we've nearly close to 3 billion vaccines distributed. Um, and it would be just great to get an insight from your perspective, how you're supporting local communities in Tanzania. I mean, because misinformation, uh, the dissemination of information is so critical. We hope Manuela Boyle can join us shortly so we can go into health literacy. But please tell us, if you can, um, how are you supporting locally in Tanzania at the moment during this crisis time? Okay, thank you, guys. Okay. What we have done okay, for last year, we, we have to uh, advise our colleagues and the community uh, on what is the best practice for the situation that we are in. So we supplied some um, like PPE and masks to uh, different uh, uh, hospitals and because uh, like before
before then, people wanted some surgical mask, and that time it was a very rare community, com community uh, commodity. So people they couldn't get it. So we we started to advise people to make those masks at home, and the large scale to give to people who they cannot afford. This is something very cheap that, and they you don't have to worry about uh, this, disposing because when you have disposable masks for Africa, it's quite a big it's a big problem because uh, people may end up reusing those things, and they, you know. They are not very hygienic. So if you have a photo mask for them, then we might to sort a lot of them. We find some, so people use them and they quite help quite a lot. And uh, again, the main thing for now, people with information, to have them become a very good source of um, of information. We get a lot of webinars on uh, vaccination and how COVID as well was uh, was spreading and what people should do. And the, the day, uh, one of the people with the danger of misinformation just going on the internet, finding something that they think is correct. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. So we, we conducted some webinars to highlight uh, or to give the people the right information. The most important thing, they're in a language that they can understand. We have to give a webinar in Swahili, most of them, uh, because most of people speak Swahili. So. Again, we is normally used is by bilingual because sometimes we don't have the words in Swahili for certain English words, so we just mix up. But the, the key was to give the people uh, information, the right information in a language that they can read, understand. And so we're still working on that. And because uh, we talk about the mental health as well during the COVID time, because the impact of mental health cannot be underestimated. It happened uh, here and it, it's worldwide. So we have we, we get a lot of webinars on mental health and well-being, how people should look after themselves and the what signs uh, to look out for uh, when someone is having some um, uh, mental uh, uh, problems. So this is the kind of information probably someone uh, in the remote area of Singapore will, will not uh, you know, understand or because, because we don't have many mental health uh, staff in, in Tanzania, to be honest. So having this kind of uh, conversation and the webinar, we can have in a small chance in, a, in a, as a link on YouTube, you can share with people on their WhatsApp, they can watch them when they are uh, somewhere that they, uh, they signal and uh, get that information going. So that's uh, what we have done, but at the moment, Data was the problem for Tanzania uh, during the COVID period, probably we all know about that. But at the moment, things are a bit different. Uh, even the president mentioned uh, a couple of days ago that, uh, okay, people have to take precautions. They have to wear a mask in, in going to uh, public buildings. And as well, she mentioned that there are about 100 uh, cases of COVID in the country. And uh, uh, I don't remember how many of those are there on, uh, on ventilator, but, uh, at least people, we can talk about it. So when you talk about something, you can easily engage uh, with people. You don't have to be uh, uh, scared to, to mention if you're breathing problems, why you mean it is COVID. So uh, we are heading the right way, I think time, uh, but uh, the Tanzania, again, joined the COVAX uh, thing. So we is the good yep. thing. Fantastic. And there's over 40 countries in, the, in Africa have joined COVAX. Um, James, uh, we, we want to look at solutions. And I think one of, the, one of the key solutions and opportunities for Africa is to adopt the social prescribing model, uh, which you've been pioneering in the UK and working very closely with colleagues around the world through the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. Um, can you, like, over to you for your presentation, really looking forward to putting some solutions on the table. Thank you very much, Gareth, and um, uh, thank you, um, Mwandi, uh, Dr. Mwandi. It was great to hear your presentation and some of the challenges that um, that, that you're um, involved in. Um, I, I, th I think, um, firstly, um, obviously, modern medicine is amazing, and uh, we, in many ways, you know, it's one of hum humankind's greatest achievements and um, the development of, of modern medicine in the 19th and 20th century. You know, the discovery of antibiotics, the um, um, the onset of vaccination and, and modern medical procedures um, that save millions of lives. And we're seeing the significant benefits of the rollout, obviously, at the moment of a vaccination for COVID-19. And there's lots of global challenges on ensuring that that vaccination reaches every part of the world. 
but actually modern medicine also has its limitations and what we're seeing um, in a number of health economies across the world is that um, medicine um, uh, sometimes can create greater harms. Uh, we're seeing issues of antimicrobial resistance. We're also seeing issues of um, addiction to opiates um, and um, guidance is beginning to change in many countries around um, the prescription um, of um, uh, opiates for chronic pain um, and um, lots of guidance around um, the benefits of, of exercise coming in. So whilst we have uh, this fantastic opportunity to, to use medicine to um, create health and well-being for people, we also recognise that the majority of health um, isn't what is created in hospitals um, or in GP practices. And actually, when we look at the sort of issues that society is facing, and when we're starting to try and build sustainable solutions for healthcare, we realise that some of the um, social reasons why uh, people um, actually um, don't achieve um, good health and wellbeing um, outcomes can be down to issues such as debt or loneliness or housing um, or food poverty um, or effective sanitation. And actually, um, we need different ways of solving this. So what we've been um, championing um, over the last few years um, in England is um, an approach uh, called social prescribing, which, which is part of a movement to rethink the medical model and look at better ways to engage people within their, with, with, with their health and well-being. So it starts on the basis of asking people what matters to them. It starts on the basis of finding out about the challenges um, and the issues that they're facing as an individual and breaks down the silos that we sometimes have in healthcare systems, because sometimes we can assume that um, an individual has cancer on a Tuesday and mental health issues on a Thursday. Um, you know, not um, seeing that whole individual um, on a single day with everything that's impacting on their lives. We also um, fail sometimes to treat the underlying causes. Um, so somebody may be presenting with um, respiratory illnesses, for example, but actually if that's caused by living in um, conditions that um, are uh, significantly affecting that respiratory illness, whether that's damp um, conditions, for example, then um, actually treating that condition is not likely to resolve the issue for that individual and we need to look um, beyond that. So this is where personalised care comes in, starting with the individual developing a plan that holistically looks at their needs, and then starting to find solutions that perhaps uh, demedicalize the, um, the, 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 the way in which we can support them, um, rather than reaching all the time for drugs, which, as I say, still play a part, but sometimes a social solution could be better. And social prescribing works on the basis of trying to find connections for people, trying to connect them to something in their communities, connect them with things that are meaningful for them, um, activities um, that may support their wider health and well-being. And it works across uh, four key zones. Um, so the first being arts and culture activities. We're seeing um, a lot of benefits in music, for example, in dance, um, you know, supporting people living with dementia by um, developing community choirs, by developing um, falls prevention in care homes, by sending professional dancers to um, get people active, get people moving um, and strengthen um, the opportunity for, 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 for people um, not to uh, fall over as often um, you know opportunities of using the arts in a creative way and actually um, the English National Opera have developed a groundbreaking program um, to support people who have um, had Covid um, and they're using opera singers to train people in breathing techniques to improve lung capacity um, and improve their, 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 their um, breathing as a consequence of the, the damage that's potentially been caused by COVID-19. Um, the second area is, is, is uh, physical exercise, um, getting people connected to walking groups, to doing park run, to um, opportunities to get out and about and, and remain active. Now that can be really, really simple. It could just be walking a few yards and building up from there. It doesn't have to make everybody into somebody that can run a marathon. You know, this is about, um, again, working with that individual, finding out what sort of movement, what sort of exercise can be good for them. We also know the third zone um, that nature is good for us, you know, being out um, in the natural environment. Um, there's lots of studies that have proven how beneficial 
um, nature um, is uh, for people's health and actually encouraging people to connect with nature, connect with groups that are involved um, in gardening groups, um, in, in conservation um, is, is really key. And finally, the fourth area is about knowledge and wisdom and learning. Um, you know, we know that 40% uh, of people living with long-term conditions lack the skills, knowledge and confidence to look after themselves and they, they, they lack the information that they need um, to live um, their life in the way that, in which they would want it. We also know that even when provided with information, a lot of people don't understand the health information that they're provided. So how can we educate people? How can we give them the opportunity to become experts in their care? And the evidence for this is also really strong. If you move somebody from having very low skills and knowledge to having the highest possible knowledge about their condition, you can reduce the visits that they make to a GP by about 19%, and you can reduce hospital admissions by about 38%. So just by increasing that ability for people to, to have that knowledge. So social prescribing is creating a new revolution in the way in which we focus on healthcare. And we've worked um, as the National Academy for Social Prescribing alongside uh, the World Health Innovation Summit with Gareth, um, and also the um, United Nations Global Sustainability Index Institute um, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, in order to form a global social prescribing um, alliance. And the aim of the global social prescribing alliance is to uh, advance social prescribing um, and create thriving communities across the world um, to generate this revolution in well-being. We want to help um, people to develop a narrative um, for the way in which health and well-being can be achieved. We want to connect clinical leaders across the world. And we've begun by having meetings in, in various countries, bringing clinical leaders together that are championing this movement. We want to develop innovative community approaches, um, working with organizations on the ground across the world, the fantastic organizations in the voluntary sector, in the social enterprise sector, in faith communities, right across the world that do amazing work. How can we connect those together? How can we connect the groups that are working in the natural environment with those that are working in the arts, with those that are working in sports and activity to create a strong community um, based around common goals? How can we train the workforce? How can we get people to focus on delivering healthcare solutions in this new way? And finally, how can we develop digital solutions as well to get people um, connected? So the Global Social Prescribing Alliance is there as a support uh, for countries around the world. Um, we're looking forward to working with key partners um, over the next uh, few months. Um, and today's a great opportunity to share the work that we've been doing. Thank you. Back to you, Gareth. Thanks, James. And I suppose from an African perspective, it, it brings opportunity given the, you know, shall we say the, if we look at the current system, which is based on, you know, disease and um, which is a pathogenic approach and very much looking at the well-being and SDG3, social prescribing very much aligns to that in a way that you can actually create new and meaningful jobs through the arts and um, as, as you've highlighted and that brings me very much on, uh, very nicely into our next speaker, which is uh, Ingolf Werdner, who's going to give us an insight into, and this is, this is what I hope this session will, will generate, is solutions. And as James has mentioned, uh, the importance of the arts. And uh, Ingolf is a, is a, is a world-renowned pianist uh, who works with us on SDG 3 and 4, uh, quality education. And I felt, um, we felt that this would be a fantastic opportunity to show how the arts can influence positive change and SDGs for the future. And um, particularly Africa has a huge opportunity, I think, in the future to invest wisely, as James mentioned there, the knowledge that we have and Dr. Moanda has spoken about. Um, Ingolf, uh, uh, an introduction, please. And then by all means, the floor is yours. Uh, please do share your wisdom and how the arts and creative arts can support the bounce back from COVID-19. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. Um, well, you know, I, I first first uh, short introduction. I mean, I'm as you said, I'm a pianist, I'm a conductor and composer, and I've, I've, I've um, performed in over fifty countries uh, by now. And um, and our mission uh, in education started um, about. Uh, well, we had the first observations nine years ago on the plane to Japan uh, because we have seen all these countries and we have seen the problems um, 
that are everywhere basically the same. So either um, music education is uh, cut out of the curriculum completely in all the countries, or if it exists, it's nowhere near good enough to um, to really bring substantial value to people, both to uh, professional musicians and to amateurs. And I will come to uh, why that's important and relevant, because uh, if you if you zoom into um, into the body uh, and and go on on the quantum level, uh, we are all frequency. Everything, each cell, and everything that that we do is is frequency, and that's why music is very much a part of everybody. Um, even even though people don't really um, notice that they are exposed to music, because we are the problem with with uh, and why music is important to us um, is that it. You know, if you if you if you look at something, if you have visual input, or if you eat something, chemical input, then it's your decision whether you look at the thing or whether you eat that thing. But the ears you can't close. So no matter what you do, you are constantly bombarded by audio input your whole life. If you go th through a busy city, it's it's very very much visible uh, that it's absolutely um, destructive. Actually, all this noise, and uh, and and as it's can be destructive, it can be also very, very beneficial if you are exposed to quality and valuable music. Um, even though if you don't understand it, the body will still understand it. Because uh, it, this is the same thing as I always tell to people in my master classes that everybody, uh, every human is musical. We just lose it over time uh, because we don't uh, cultivate it. But even though we lost the musicality, so to speak, the body still needs the waves and the music um, on, on a high level. And I also say that uh, to my, uh, to my when, I, when I'm lecturing uh, to, to fellow musicians and pianists, that it's so important. Uh, it's so important what you give your body. You know, you would also not eat uh, McDonald's uh, every day for 10 years uh, and, and still uh, so since we don't do that, we still do that with music very much on an everyday basis. We give ourselves fast food, and which is very, very uh, unhealthy. And for sick people anyway, I mean, as, uh, as James said, it's, it's uh, absolutely proven how beneficial um, music and the arts can be for, um, uh, for the healthcare. Um, but even for healthy people. It's so, so, so important. And this is our big mission. And uh, now um, <laughs> I've messed everything up, probably, because I should uh, also say what we do. Actually, um, this mission of ours uh, led uh, Paulina Wunder, my co-founder, and me to uh, start uh, two startups by now, uh, Apasio and Apassimo, which are software solutions for um, music education. Um, we are blessed to have um, um, many uh, clients, uh, high-level universities all over Europe that use our software on a daily basis uh, for their music education. And uh, we have the technological um, uh, expertise to bring much, much more than, uh, than what we currently do. So our plans are uh, very much going into medical fields uh, where, we, where we will use our algorithms to match people um, both musically and uh, especially emotionally uh, with the how you you know what's your energy and how you fit and who can be the right educator for you because the right teacher for me is not necessarily the right teacher for you and this is our motto so what we want to uh, do with our software solutions is to give people and the connections to people that they can actually help them and actually give them the the wisdom they need in order to thrive so yeah so i think very much um, this is um, uh, this is this is this is very very important for our society too and it's it's not it's uh, overlooked until now one has to say uh, it's not mainstream but i'm very happy that it uh, that it comes very much into the into the minds of people um, i will i will speak about that uh, amongst other conferences at the uh, internet governance forum in in december this year where which shows that um, that it's uh, politicians and and change makers are are absolutely interested in the angle of music especially in the um, in the hyper technological future that we go into um, this is the last point that i want to make uh, that um, in the in in a future where 
most likely whatever will come, if it's singularity or if it's AGI or just a very sophisticated version of AI that will basically shape our lives in a substantial way, um, it's, it's very, very important that we actually give the people, the humans, the, the skills that to be better than the super machine of the future or of the past uh, or of the present already, because the computers are very, very good in in uh, in in um, dealing with loads of data much better than we will ever be. But there is soft skills, there is 21st century skills and all these human abilities that will be twice as important in the hyper technological future and music is is absolutely the way to get all these um, uh, these traits and skills that you will need in the job market of the 21st century uh, and that's why i think it's um it's, it's very very important that we include the arts and i'm very very happy that uh, with gareth's and uh, roland's and you and gsii work we have together created uh, already the sdg youth uh, symphony orchestra that um, will be hopefully growing uh, and um, and that shows especially how how thirsty youth is for music and actually how bright the future can look. Uh, so so I'm very very happy. Thanks, Ingolf. Um, fantastic to get an insight into the opportunities going forward from the music perspective. I think you made a very uh, relevant point that we don't really think about music as in frequency as in what goes into our ears, we can't close our ears. I think this is an important part of health and well-being because, you know, what we think and what we what we absorb, we've, we very much become. So it can have a detrimental effect on our health and well-being. And I suppose if you look at over the last 18 months, we faced enormous challenges, a lot of negativity. Um, James mentioned mental health and well-being, so huge challenges there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a short presentation on sustainable development goals, the work that we're engaged in around SDG3 and supporting SDG implementation around the world through World Health Innovation Summit with our partners, Global Social Prescribing Alliance, um, and also the work of the UNGSII Foundation working in the 25 plus 5 cities, the UN Habitat Partnership that we have around the cities investment platform as well and then give an insight into what the future of healthcare looks like and the opportunities for Africa going forward. So I'll just uh, begin to share my screen and then um, just dive into a presentation, a short presentation, um, which I hope you can all see, just a little bit of a, an intro to myself, uh, who I am, what I do, shall we say. Um, I'm the expert lead on SDG3 with the UNGSII Foundation, member of Pope Francis's Vatican COVID-19 Commission, Group 2, which is looking to the future, working with James on the Global Social Prescribing Alliance, and there's our contact details. Um, if I go to what is the real challenge of the future, shall we say, I think we're all well aware of what comes after COVID-19 with climate change, potential of a recession, biodiversity collapse. These are the sort of things that are on our agenda. And I suppose this links in very nicely to what Ingolf was speaking about what is currently being fed to us and it's extremely negative. Let's look and see what the future shall hold in terms of positivity and look at the current situation with COVID-19 and how we can use platforms to create value and also the opportunity of healthcare to become that catalyst of creating value. Um, business and COVID over the last you know 18 months we've seen about 400 million jobs lost um, but at the same time, we've seen a lot of companies, the top 30 companies in the world, certainly have increased their profits up 100 million or 100 billion plus. Um, and what sort of value are they reinvesting back into communities? So the Oxfam report recently, they're only reinvesting 0.5% of that profit back into the community. So we need to look at how do we fund companies in the future. And that's very much aligned to the SDGs. We want to see the future of business aligned to social value. And we believe through the World Health Innovation Summit, through our partners, that we can create new and meaningful jobs and wealth creation through platforms, as the tech companies have done in the past, similar models, but also amplify that through health and well-being. So just a little bit about WIS and what it does, how it works. It's a platform. It's a global platform. We have programs for children. Um, with at work looks at stress management in the workplace seniors falls prevention quality of life and loneliness and then green is very much focused on environmental issues 
Um, we bring people together, we connect the dots, we basically break the silos, we bring patients, clinicians, managers, voluntary sector, education and the business communities together to share that knowledge so that we come up with solutions and then we amplify those solutions across the world to bring investment also. So this is very much what James was speaking about and, and very much aligned to social prescribing as well and the current model that we have. And really, if you see, look at the process of disease, you see the red section here. And um, this is very much what we have based our whole um, healthcare model on, which is treating disease. And really, this brings with it huge challenges, as we've seen. And by 2030, we'll face a staff shortfall of about 18 million staff worldwide. And I know in Africa, for example, there's chronic shortages of healthcare professionals and across the UK and worldwide. This is a huge problem and it will lead to further problems um, in the future, particularly with COVID's impact. In the past, UK, Europe, uh, America and Australia would have been able to attract staff from the likes of the Philippines and other areas. And I can foresee that those countries who have suffered during COVID-19 will look to retain their own staff now. So you're going to see a big shift in how recruitment and retention of staff um, comes in the next few years. But the opportunity around social prescribing and looking at SDG3, good health and well-being, is in the green here. And this is where we can actually create models and new ways of working that promotes good health and well-being. So prevention at scale. That's really where the opportunity lies. And I think we all believe that there's an opportunity here to create new and meaningful jobs, but also implement the 17 Sustainable Development Goals using these platforms that are now out there and amplifying that message. It's important that the investment flows in, into these areas so that we can move. At the moment, we only have about 4 to 6% of global investment. Around $8 trillion a year is spent in the healthcare system. You only have four to six percent of that actually goes in prevention. So it's time to you know grow that sector and let's see what the results bring. We believe if you put a pound in, you'll get 36 back minimum. So again, looking at why, why do we need to do this? As I mentioned, the staff shortfall, the, the health economy is growing, more money funding going into it. And um, global population, as we all are aware, we're getting close to eight billion. This will grow nearly to 10 by 2050. The number of people over the age of 60 should reach roughly 2 billion very shortly. And COVID-19 has really shown how vulnerable our health systems are. Um, so we're ill-equipped and we need major transformation. And that's why we need to accelerate the process. We need to get around the table with all the partners and ensure that we bring investment to the table as well to promote good health and well-being. Um, mentioned the city's investment portal, uh, which is a partnership between UN Habitat and um, Think City, uh, UNGSII. And basically what we're doing is we are connecting investors with projects in emerging nation, in developing nations and around the world. Klagenfurt has just joined uh, as an example. And this is a portal that will allow us to invest in sustainable activities of the future and make that energy transition. Um, again, it's an SDG implement, uh, platform for fast track and SDG implementation. Um, there's more of this on our website and I can, I can share the details afterwards. Just a little bit around partnership work and James mentioned the fates, they play a huge role. Um, having a partnership with the Catholic Church, working with the Vatican COVID-19 Commission, the European Commission, Michael Muller there, the, the initiative he set up, the United Nations Global Sustainable Index. And that's the session there at the SDG lab in Davos. So partnerships is all about ensuring that we get to where we need to be, be by 2030. You'll hear a lot of talk about net zero and 2050 and that, but let's remember that 193 heads of state agreed to implement the 70 in SDGs by 2030, not 2050, not 2045, but 2030. So we need to accelerate our, 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 our goal or sorry our strategy and we need to ensure that we reach those targets so that we leave no one behind and um, james mentioned the global social prescribing alliance and this was a, a an initiative that we've launched with who and national academy of social prescribing and ungsii and this really is about us uh, being able to export that wisdom i mean the uk is certainly leading in this space 
But we now are developing partnerships right around the world. We have a, an upcoming meeting with the Californian uh, Surgeon General, for example, um, reaching into the States and also working with our partners in Africa and Asia and around the world. And we very much see this as an area of growth. So this, this is something that you can check out, uh, globalsocialprescribingalliance.com. Um, you'll be able to find out more information. And we've also just published a playbook, which gives a fantastic insight into how you can implement these projects locally. Just going forward, then, what are the next steps in terms of G20 and supporting um, nations make this change? Myself, James, and colleagues from Finland and Roland uh, spoke at the recent Global Solutions Summit, which is a think tank for G20 nations. And then um, we very much see this as an opportunity for the future. We've had a briefing paper that we submitted, and that's been considered for the T20 and G20 event in uh, later this year in October in Italy. So we'll have a further opportunity to lobby and, and bring about policy change. Um, finally, I just wanted to talk about you know, the SDGs, and it really does give us a roadmap to build back stronger. We can embrace the change. We can work collaboratively. We can be solution focused. But we most importantly, we need strong leadership and we need those and you watching this to, to take action, to see what you can do. Can you implement ch uh, positive change locally? Um, so that, that's really an insight for myself. I will, uh, I will just stop my sharing of the screen and just say that I, I hope that you find that interesting. And we'll go back to the panel now and then um, we'll just ask uh, Dr. Moande, and um, if you could give us an insight into what you see the challenges will be and opportunities over the next 12 to 24 months. Hi, thank you, guys. I think uh, for the moment, the, the challenges, uh, I try to look into the, um, the opportunities first. I think, it, uh, I think that's the, the key thing with the, every crisis comes uh, an opportunity. I think it, we have seen uh, uh, in this uh, pandemic, uh, there are a lot of young people. I mean, because Africa is a very young continent, a lot of young people in there, a lot of uh, smart and creative minds. And the, most people can think out of the box most of the time. That's how life is in Africa. You have to think out of the box all the time. So during the pandemic, there have been a lot of innovation uh, happened to tackle the, pan uh, the pandemic. like. Uh, Thing like a uh, homemade, um, hand-free uh, sanitizer to wash your hand and things like that. And uh, people build some uh, uh, ventilators as well uh, uh, in Africa. But the problem is, uh, I think uh, we don't appreciate what we create and just develop that to go further. And so we just uh, we become more consumers than just um, you know producers. So I think. Uh, uh, if we can store and sit back and just look, we have something, we have a big opportunity here to make a big difference by this crisis. We have creative minds that can think and uh, bring out stuff that can help our community. The government and the leaders and the policy makers should support those young people who come with uh, all this uh, creative uh, work. And I think uh, most of the time, when the crisis is over, those people get forgotten and nothing happened and you never hear about them ever again. And I think uh, uh, we have to take this opportunity uh, to, uh, so if Africa need to move forward. As the, the other thing as well is that the diaspora. The diaspora, African diaspora, have a big, big uh, um, um, place in uh, making change in, uh, in the continent. And I think uh, because those people, they understand how things are and how things work in there. So I think it's easier if you, uh, if they feel more valued and supported, they become more willing to bring whatever expertise and the knowledge and skills that they have back into the continent and make the continent even much uh, richer. Because uh, I'm personal, I believe the continent is not a poor continent. That's got so much resource that just, unfortunately, is the management of the resource uh, uh, is just uh, uh, done a little bit badly or in a selfish way. So I think uh, that is uh, 
a way that we can use in the diaspora to make uh, to make some uh, positive gains. Uh, the other thing, the other opportunity is for the tech companies in Africa as well, or in the world, who want to invest in technology. I think uh, we have found that uh, during this pandemic, uh, the technology, the tech, the digital technology have just played a very big part. So, uh, you know, things like, you know, now here we are talking somewhere in, in Kampala, somewhere in Australia, we're in the UK, we just uh, uh, having this conversation. This is the, and before then, probably this was not seen, uh, seen as a thing. So I think the tech companies, like the, uh, the telecom company, they should just uh, build or beef up their network so that people in the remote areas of, uh, of the content can access because there's a wealth of information out there and a lot of things that they can gain uh, uh, from others uh, is a learning opportunities. Because, uh, so if they can make the networks more uh, accessible and more um, powerful, if you like, uh, we can have more reach and they can just empower our people. Because uh, like uh, uh, Ingo said about, say about the music, okay, in Africa, we dance. In Africa, we, we just, we just, we accept music, Every, everything, the funeral, the party, people dance and sing. And uh, you know, and that because, uh, and I took my kids to, uh, to Africa two years ago, and they, they were just like, wow, because even little kids are just dancing, and they, they, my kid they couldn't stop just joining and enjoying that. And I think that's part of well being. And, they, and they, in Africa, we don't see that as an opportunity, we see it like a, just a way of life. In a way, it's good, but I think we can capitalize on that. That's a big opportunity as well. And so, if you take Startup Symphony uh, in Africa, you're going to have fantastic tunes, which are just probably uh, the creative, uh, creativeness is just endless. So, there's another opportunity for, you know, okay, let's go to Africa and just create this symphony, and it just uh, <laughs> should be great. So, that's it. Yes, got it. No, I think that's I think that's a great insight. Uh, so I think you're 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 definitely um, should we say uh, opening opportunities here in this discussion. And um, I'll just say to those who are listening in or viewing, and um, if you do have a question that you want to put to the panel, please by all means raise your hand and and pop in the question in the chat bar. And um, I just want to I'll I'll come back to you now because I wanted to talk about the dysphoria, but also the youth. But let's go to James and James and um, over the next 12 to 24 months and um, we're going to see, you know, uh, opportunities arise in terms of, you know, out of the challenges that we face, we need to we need to adopt new models of care. We need to look at new ways of working. You spoke about how the UK is, is working with English opera and. Um, can you just expand a little bit on where you see the future in terms of healthcare, social prescribing? Um, I know, you know, your UK focus, but also with the Global Social Prescribing Alliance, where the opportunities are. And then, then we'll come to Ingolf and talk about the music opportunities. Thanks, Gareth. Um, so one of the things that we're doing um, here in England and, and a lot of countries um, are also um, looking at investing in this way is the development of non-clinical uh, workers in healthcare who can actually actively work on connecting people with the vibrant opportunities that there are in our communities. Um, so in England, we're calling those individuals link workers. Um, we now have 1,500 link workers in place. And we've got an aim to have 4,500 link workers in place. And what these individuals do, and the fantastic work that goes on right across the country, is that link workers um, sit down, have time to talk, find out what matters to that individual, look at the barriers, the issues um, that they're facing, look at the challenges in their life, and then start to work with them to make connections to um, groups, to community interventions, to activities, um, to specialist services, um, to peers, uh, perhaps living with the same condition as them, to volunteers in the community. And connecting people in this way creates the environment for health to um, be developed naturally and creates the environment for those connections to forge uh, lasting partnerships to sustain um, the health outcomes for that individual. And, and I think that's a really radical way of looking at healthcare, actually, starting with an individual. 
it may sound ridiculous, um, you know, because we've known that individuals have skills and knowledge that they bring to a, their own healthcare for a long period of time, but actually we don't always value that. And working with those individuals to unlock the assets that they bring to their care is, is incredibly important. And I think as we, as we look at your question around the challenges, um, you know, post pandemic challenges, um, and uh, looking at um, how we build back better and how we restore um, some of the things in society that we've lost over the last um, few months. Um, I think what we need is, is a whole societal approach. Um, I think some of the traditional boundaries between the voluntary sector, the statutory sector, the local government, um, national governments, um, people and communities, that, that those, those, those boundaries don't make sense anymore. You know, we've got to come together as a whole society. We've got to recognise um, that there are skills, there are opportunities um, to be unlocked in all different sectors. And I think that's really, really important. And it, it's fantastic today to be sitting, um, you know, with, with, with a doctor and a pianist and conductor um, and thinking about the fact that in the future, you know, it may not be a default that somebody gets a referral to a doctor. Um, they may get a referral through uh, to uh, uh, sit down with a pianist. Um, and it isn't that isn't that a wonderful um, opportunity to try and think about health through a very, very different lens? I, th I think that's very much what we want to try and see and have that holistic approach to break down the silos because, you know, health is wealth, as, as, as they say. And I think health is, is, is not, you know, it, it's a wider, has a wider impact, the social determinants of health. Um, Ingolf, um, you know, from your perspective, I mean, the, the opportunities, I mean, we're learning from yourself today, um, you know, the opportunities for music to influence not only health, but shall we say education of the future? And, uh, you know, where do you see the opportunities in the next 12 to 24 months? I mean, you talked about the music. There must be exciting opportunities looking at Africa from a musical perspective as well. The frequencies, the sound. And um, also, I know from a medicinal pl place, we can, we can speak to Dr. Moanda as well. I'm sure there's plenty of knowledge that can be shared from Africa into Western society as well. But Ingo, from, from your perspective, um, where do you see the opportunities for the next 12 to 24 months? And how do we build back better using the arts? Well, I see, um, and not only uh, not only is it my wish, but I see that the market is, is going this direction, that we have loads of opportunity. And I don't say that... Um, to be positive, uh, it, it is really positive. So we, due to the, the connectivity simply, due to the softer solutions that uh, people now had to use, um, the doors are wide open for people to actually reach, um, let's say, knowledge that they would have never reached in a direct way before. So this is very, very, very um, positive. And um, I had to, because I, I, I was um, showing this because when Dr. Mwande said about the dancing and the, and the, you know, the music impact in, in Africa and generally, I love that because this is exactly what it is. So is it, this is the, in fact, this is the proof um, that we are music, that we are frequency, that if, if there is good music and, and valuable music coming, then our bodies are moving, especially kids' bodies. And this, this is so healthy, uh, first of all, and it, it shows perfectly that uh, how, how much we are one with the music and, and why, it, why it is so important to, to be aware of quality in music and be aware what you feed uh, your ears. Uh, but back to the opportunities. So first of all, it's I think uh, due to the solutions, we really can reach more and more people to get more and more knowledge and, and we can select much better uh, what we kind of take into us or listen to or, um, uh, you know, and, and especially um, important um, with these uh, solutions uh, is and will be for the future that music just is as simple as this music has to get back uh, to having a major role in all schools in curriculums like it was uh, in the past mathematics was as important as music in da vinci's time and uh, i know we are now advanced in in so many ways and um, and gotten uh, worse also in so many ways at the same time but i think we have a huge opportunity 
that we that we leverage this power of music because I especially see that in in my work when when I'm with my developers and and uh, when we do uh, software development and write code, then I see that on an everyday basis how important actually music education would be for coders. This has not they will never they, they don't have to be musicians and uh, and we, we by god don't want to be uh, we don't want everybody to be a musician um but uh, but doesn't matter what you do um this kind of out of the box thinking this combination of motor skills and and um and thoughts generally because this is why piano is so so important for the brain and so good for the brain because you constantly if you practice a lot you constantly um connect motoric um, uh, movement with an intention so may it be a musical intention or whatever and this is and this is what sharpens your brain it sharpens your, re uh, your reactions it, it sharpens your uh, out of the box thinking and this is uh, this is just one of many um, um, advantages of music but i think this is the um, to come to the point the main advantage is that we now take the opportunity and get everybody a proper valuable music education and by the way it's not about genre i'm not about i'm not a classical musician that says classical music is the best i i, I gave a ted talk about that the value is is in all genres by the way you have bad classical music you have great classical music you have bad pop you have great pop and so on um and so we have to leverage this quality music education for everybody doesn't matter which uh, kind of way of work you will you, you will have and I just wanted to go to James just on this point. Um, uh, there is so much emerging evidence coming out about, you know, these sort of solutions and the value that they create. Do you, this, this, you know, when we talk about opportunities in terms of, you know, you talked about new job creation and that, and this really does open up a massive opportunity when you think about educational systems and um, you know development of research and um, development of new ways of working and um, Ingolf spoke about previously about you know artificial intelligence and everyone is afraid and fearful of you know displacement of jobs but perhaps this gives us an opportunity to actually create something that we want to do as a society so as an individual I can now focus on what my passion is but also from a medical perspective, we can show and demonstrate, well, actually, this is good for you, you know, less stress, less likely to develop cancer. And, um, you know, so this is probably a, an enormous opportunity. And I mean, I'd love to hear some of the evidence base that you're, you're developing through, you know, NASP and, and through the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. W what are your thoughts here, James? So I, I think the um, thing is here that, um, you know, the evidence base um, is, incredibly strong it has been for um many many years now but we've not necessarily applied that in the way in which we develop solutions so you know we we know that exercise is 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 really good for us we know that if that was a drug we should all be uh, prescribed it um and there's not um many circumstances that um exercise is not beneficial um to human beings uh, we also know that um uh, you know, the emerging evidence, as, as you mentioned, in, in terms of music is, is really strong as well. That um, in, in golf has mentioned some of the areas, but we, we know that, um, you know, experiencing music um, can release endorphins. Um, we know that it can reduce um, cortisol uh, levels by reducing stress. You know, there's all sorts of um, bi biomedical um, things that happen um, to people when they are experiencing music and, and I, I think where where music and the arts is concerned there's different levels that we need to look at I mean, Ingolf touched on a few of these but you know just experiencing music or the arts is, is good for us going and watching a live concert um, going and watching a performance we know that that has an impact on, on our mental health and well-being and the community connection that we get is also really important from that um, I, I think the evidence shows that uh, being socially isolated and lonely is equivalent to smoking 25 cigarettes a day, um, you know, in terms of the health impact. So actually that connection through experiencing music is really important. You can then go up a level and participate. So singing in a choir, playing in an orchestra, and that's going to have a, a higher level of connection for somebody. That's going to create a much better circumstances for them to, to, to live well. And then um, you can have solutions that 
go up another level and become specific interventions, whether that's a bit of tech that connects people effectively, whether or not that's um, using music as a specific therapy or um, creating a playlist for somebody with dementia to trigger certain aspects of their daily life, um, you know, a playlist for relaxing, a playlist for getting dressed in the morning, a playlist for activity, you know, those sorts of things um, uh, are really, really uh, 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 positive things to work on. So, so I think that we, we're only just tapping into uh, the massive potential of connecting health and well-being over here that's existed over here for many years with all of the things that have also existed over here that have made us well or not well, um, that we have not necessarily acknowledge, whether that's music and the arts or the natural environment or exercise and uh, being part of society, being socially connected. And what social prescribing does, it brings all of that together. And it says, let's just work in a very different way. Let's trust different people. Let's open up health and well-being to new people, to new sectors, to new audiences, and to new um, workforce as well. Because, um, you know, I think we do need to train up um, clinicians in recognizing the benefits of, of social activity. We need to make sure that that's embedded in medical schools. We need to make sure that personalized care um, and social prescribing is there. And we're doing lots of things with the Personalized Care Institute to start doing that in medical schools over here. But we also need to um, look at um, other communities as well and train musicians in um, health and well-being and supporting people, you know, as, a, as, a, as an extra string to their bow, uh, you know, a virtual string to their, to their bow, um, and, and create uh, the opportunities for, for learning in those sectors as well. So I, I, think, I think it's a really great and exciting future for, for the way in which we deliver healthcare. Absolutely. And that brings us to the sustainable development goals, which you make, which is really so important to the topic of discussion today. Um, I suppose one of the areas that I suppose all of us are working towards is how do we finance all these projects, you know, because when we talk about the value created, how do we measure that? And I think we can learn a lot from the tech companies, because if you look at the market cap value of a lot of these technology companies, you know, you say to yourself, they're worth a billion, they're worth trillions of dollars, whatever it may be it's mainly down to intangible assets. So it's all about intellectual capital. It's about the numbers on the platform, the volume. And I think we need to see how do we bridge the gap between the financial markets and healthcare? How do we demonstrate that value created so that the investment flows? I think COVID has really given us that opportunity to kind of explore that and accelerate that process. And um, I just want to also talk about um, African solutions and perhaps Dr. Moanda, you could give us a, a bit of an insight into, you know, when you talk about mental health, I see there's fantastic initiatives in Zimbabwe, for example, you know, just people getting together, congregating around a, 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 an actual bench where they can actually discuss their problems. Do you see out of COVID, you know, you talked about solutions that, that are evolving in Africa and you talked about digitalization. Do you see in the next, you know, shall we say, couple of years, Africa uh, taking that leap? Because it's very much seen as an emerging developing continent that it needs so much support in terms of its health infrastructure. Do you think Africa can actually come out of this and take the bull by the horns and say, we want to promote good health and well-being? We want to empower our local communities to improve their health and well-being and focus on a preventative approach, which could absolutely accelerate their development as, as, a, as a continent in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiencies, you know, keeping people fit and well. That, that's a massive opportunity. So what's your thoughts on that, Dr. Moanda? Yeah, thank you, guys. I think... Uh... That uh, is, a, is a big opportunity because uh, um, it's, it doesn't cost much. All you need is just need a, a champion. You just need a few people who want to take this, that extra, extra mile. Because uh, um, one we should, uh, thing we should understand is getting ill is very, very expensive in Africa. It's very, very expensive. So. But again, staying healthy is fairly cheap. You just have to look after yourself. Uh, and, and that will, uh, will, will improve your income. Okay, it's going to make you happier. And then, you know, the community is happy. Everything, everyone's healthy. So I think for Africa, I think in the, the 
issue of well-being should be at the top of the government agenda uh, for development and it be part of the main strategy because uh, it does not need uh, too much money in it. Uh, I think it's already there. So someone just have to just turn it on and uh, there it is. And that would serve um, most uh, most countries uh, or they all cost a lot of money. And uh, they should, Africa should be lived on the solution that they, they, they come up with. Of course, you can learn from other people. Then you adjust those, uh, those learning points from other people to fit in what, not copying what someone is doing, but to, to adjust what you're doing to take yourself uh, at, a, at a higher level, a better position. So I think uh, when it comes to mental health, and uh, because uh, it's got a bit of a stigma in most of uh, African culture, mental health got a, quite a, a big stigma. So it's not something that we um, we talk openly about. So I think if uh, people can feel comfortable and stuff, like I said, we need a champion who can get out there and just make this normal. If you're talking about music, why can you not talk about the mental health? No, you, you talk about the diabetes, why can you not talk about the mental health? So we just have to take that part of the normal conversation and then uh, people can understand. Because sometimes people have issues, but they just, uh, they don't know how to uh, approach it or they don't know they have issues. It takes someone else, okay, you know, that's, you know, something like this is happening, okay, you know, talking to someone. And, and, and that's what it all takes. And in, in Africa, we have more uh, a community because uh, I grew up in a, in a village where if everyone knew everyone. If I, if I was naughty and my mom would know that I can be um, disciplined uh, by the neighbor or something like that. So we can do those things, look after one another. And that is, that is a part of the culture anyway. And I, uh, I think, uh, we just, uh, whether an old globalization in a way is a good thing, but I think we should not drop out the things that have kept us going. And I think we can build them better uh, to save us uh, uh, for the future. I think uh, this is a cheap way of, uh, of, you know, you don't have to be rich, but you just have to be, you know, happy and healthy. And that's the way uh, I, I say it. <laughs> I, I I couldn't agree more. I think, but I was going to say as well. I mean, there's a huge opportunity really for the dysphoria. You know, you you you're an expat, shall we say, from Tanzania. You left Tanzania. You've left the continent of Africa. You 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 set up shop in in the UK. But there's certainly an opportunity here, isn't there, for your colleagues around the world to come together to help Africa, to share that wisdom, to go to go back to the roots. But also, as you say, there, you know it's really just a, a common sense approach and, and looking after your health and well-being. It's not difficult. You can be very cost effective, you know, as my mother used to say to me every day, you know, have an apple a day, you know, keeps the doctor away, just simple things like that, you know, how I eat and you know, how you exercise and just getting out, getting 30 minutes of exercise in every day. I mean, these can have profound effects and, you know, where is the role? What do you see the role of the dysphoria of Africa? Because you've got so many people around the world who affiliate with the continent of Africa. And I think there's a, there is a misconception there that, you know, people believe that Africa is, it doesn't have any wealth, but Africa has a lot of wealth and it has a lot of knowledge. It has a lot of wisdom and um, it has a very young population. That's a resource that can be tapped into. Um, so, so do you think the dysphoria around the world has a role to play to help you know, recover from COVID-19 to help propel Africa forward? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the diaspora have uh, a big uh, part to play in, in this. I think the, the main thing is for uh, the policymakers and the government to, uh, to take the opportunity because sometimes some of the diaspora feel like because they left their country, they just uh, uh, they'd be seen as if they just abandoned the country and they just to go somewhere else. So they, in some places, there's a bit of bad blood, if you like. And I think um, if government uh, see the diaspora as an ally in um, pushing the country forward, I think because there's so many experts, just have, uh, you know, 
little group. We have all sorts of things. We have engineer, they're engineers, they're doctors, they're nurses, of uh, physios, and they become mental health experts. So, and they have different sort of training and different sort of exposure. So if they are sort of feel a bit more engaged by the uh, relevant government, I think they can play a major role uh, in making uh, progress uh, in the continent, in, especially in the, when it comes to recovery uh, uh, after, uh, after COVID. I think uh, we're still working on that. For example, in Tanzania, the diaspora have uh, uh, we're working hard to engage the government uh, to uh, around the issue of COVID. And I think um, things are changing. And I think you, you know, the diaspora have put a bit of more, um, a bit of more push to see the, the, for the government to see what we see because they, you know, it's not, uh, we are all connected in a, in a way. So it's not just, okay, Africa on its own, you know, you know Europe and America on, on their own. We are all uh, one. So Africa depend on other countries and other countries depend on Africa as well. In the, you know, so this has to be that uh, mutual benefit uh, to be realized. So the diaspora can take, uh, it's been seen as part of the solution. And that to me, I see that we are part of the solution. So the government has to engage. I mean, for example, for, for together we are we we are engaging the, with the government. We work closely with our our high commissioner here and our diaspora desk in, uh, in Tanzania. And uh, similarly, our colleagues in America they're doing the same. And I think, uh, uh, hope in a, in a in a in a year or two, things can be different. We can all yes go back there, maybe not permanent, just to go to help to see, you know, sit at the table, discuss, see what we can do better to lift our people. And that's, uh, uh, that's what I see the position of the diaspora is very, very crucial in this. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I, I totally agree. I think um, I was going to go to Ingolf and just ask Ingolf, you know, the music industry, um, as, as, as James and Dr. Moamba has, has said, we're all connected. Um, the music industry has suffered just as the health services has suffered. Um, what do you think are the lessons here and the learning going forward that we need this joined up approach, that we need a bit more collaboration? We need to see things through different lenses. James mentioned, you know, having a look from, you know, from your perspective, from a pianist perspective, looking on the outside, you know, what do you see as lessons here? Like, you know, for future, we need to avoid future pandemics. You know, this, this <laughs> certainly will not be the, the last one. And we need to ensure that this doesn't happen again. You know, I'd love just a little, a little bit of insight from yourself. What, what do you think? What are the lessons here? Oh, that's a big question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, um, there's definitely. I mean, from from the let's start from the music business perspective. Is there there's definitely lots of things that didn't go right before the pandemic, and I personally. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that there's too much of everything. This is a general in our world. We are bombarded by too much information, too much of everything. And people can't because the brain just shuts down. If you get too much input, you just either you you try to take as much as possible and shallowly or you focus on just a couple to to really take on. So I think uh, th there was in the music uh, business too much of everything going on before. So I, I see absolutely a as I am, I'm always positive. I see a, 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 a big opportunity that we can now uh, build back like that, like that, that, that we have less of things, but better. I think this is this is what we need to focus on. I don't know if uh, humans will learn, uh, they seldomly do, but, um, but I definitely think that there's a huge opportunity here. Um, and uh, yes, and I think it's not only in the music business, generally we have to, I know there are lots of movements like humane technology and stuff like that, which are like very much because we will have to, I think in the post pandemic world, uh, or in the, let's say, next 10 years, uh, we have to ask the value question for many things, we have to ask, why are we doing things uh, in the first place, and and then um, answer this and then make changes accordingly in, in almost every field. So I think uh, I see this opportunity, like a cleansing, if you, if you will, like that we get rid of the things that we didn't need 
uh, and uh, and maybe because of money issues that we have to take care of expenses and so on uh, things will just become rarer which is a good thing um, and maybe people will appreciate uh, things more uh, so and i think it's a healthier approach um, no, I, I, I agree. And we're coming to the end of the session. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I just want to go to each one of the panelists as well. And we do a final wrap up. But then I, I wanted to just have a quick chat with James about um, learnings, lessons and opportunities. And, you know, in healthcare, we always talk about best practice, sharing best practice and learning from our mistakes. And I think one of the things we have to do as a, as a society as well, if we look at our parliaments as well, they were set up in the 1900s and you know, we're now in the 21st century and we need to adopt and change very rapidly in this digital age. Um, do you think there's, you know, there's, there's a profound opportunity in the healthcare sector to, to actually accelerate that learning process, you know, from, from the point of view, James, you know, we talked about the evidence. I know I've worked in many clinical settings for many years where we know that a certain situation works, but however, we need more evidence and, and, and we need to almost, um, you know, continuously provide that evidence to show that it's valuable. Um, do you think there's an opportunity here for, to accelerate that process? You look at the vaccine uh, rollout, for example, you know, which, you know, really showed what, what 12 months of, of focused effort, like Ingolf has just, just spoken about there, you know, we literally turned around to the best minds of the world and said, get a solution for that as quickly as possible and do whatever it takes. And we managed to do that within 12 months, which is just phenomenal, you know, so we condense processes down to have an effective vaccine. Do you see that what Ingolf has touched on as, as, as a future for, for healthcare? I think there's so much possibility here. I mean, as you say, I mean, the, the response um, around the world and the response of science in creating a vaccine has just been breathtaking in terms of um, uh, the, the, the speed at which um, uh, people have moved. If you also look at, at what's happened in um, England with three quarters of a million people signing up to be NHS volunteer responders to support people in their own communities and how communities have come together um, much stronger um, than they've perhaps done before to support neighbours, to support people that have been uh, more clinically and socially vulnerable um, to COVID-19. I think that's been huge. And we need to, we need to continue that rate of change, don't we? We need to continue that pace. We, we also need to continue that level of connection as well. I, th I think one of the, the challenges, um, uh, just in uh, your, your question there around what we need to do, I think what we need to do is we need to accept that good practice and solutions could be happening somewhere else and we just need to adopt them. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think in healthcare and possibly in other industries is the not invented here syndrome. Um, and, and actually, um, I think we've got to embrace the fact that many of the solutions are already out there. They could be in a community organization. They could be in a different country. Um, they could be um, in a different industry. And actually we've got to just be more accepting of those solutions coming from a different source rather than trying to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. And I think that's a big challenge. We don't have the time to do it. We don't have the luxury of that time. We've got communities that, that are struggling. We've got individuals that are struggling and we've all got a responsibility to, to, to help and support. So if there is a fantastic solution in Africa, we need to adopt it over here. If there is a fantastic solution in the music industry, we need to get that embedded. And I think we've just got to look um, across um, global boundaries and borders and look across industry boundaries and borders and, and get on with it. <laughs> I think that's it. I, I think this is a really fascinating point. And you touched on it earlier. You know, you talked about social enterprises. You talked about the voluntary sector. And I think we have to also start to recognize that these are businesses, you know. And one of the things I was, I had a, I met a, a student at lunchtime today. We were having a conversation about the future and about, you know, opportunities. And, and we look at all these companies around the world, you know, those that are making, you know, enormous amounts of money. And then we, de we never seem to see a, a social enterprise at, at, at a scale, you know, like, why can't we have um, social businesses that do good in their communities that generate large sums of cash flow that can be reinvested back into the community? And then the community knows that that money is coming back into society so that that's helping their local communities. I think we can see that shift coming. COVID hopefully can accelerate that process. 
because ultimately it comes down to knowledge and wisdom and shared values. And I think, you know, we as a, as a global community can, can, can foster that as, as, you know, because what do we want for our children? What sort of society do we want? And um, so I think those solutions are out there. I think if you go around the world as well, and if you go into each local community, you'll almost identic, identify with local solutions that can have global impact. You know, so people doing stuff locally, really good stuff that can have a wider impact. And I'm sure Africa can 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 really accelerate that process in the future. And um, let me just uh, wrap up by, you know, just coming to each one of you just for some final words of wisdom to, the, to those watching. And um, I'll start with Dr. Mwanda and, you know, uh, just summarize the session and um, share your final thoughts on, on your thoughts for the, for the future, for sustainable development goals, for COVID-19 and for Africa. Okay, thank you, Gary. Uh, my, my final point would be, uh, I think we need to be adaptable, adaptability and the learning on the go and the fast is, uh, as, we, as we have done during COVID. And so we have proved that it can be done. So we just have to, uh, to be able to learn on the go and uh, adapt pretty quickly. And, uh, but uh, the main thing as well I would like to see is having honest, uh, decisive and effective leadership uh, of uh, um, our nations. I think that's, uh, that has also has been a very, very important uh, point uh, uh, in this pandemic. So having a good, uh, leadership that listen to the people, not to uh, what they have in their own boardroom, but what do the listen to the people because uh, uh, everyone's voice matters. And I think uh, you know that first you you ignore uh, the farmer and the village. Maybe the one who uh, have the solution just uh, he or she might say one thing. Okay, oh, it, it just it, it gives you that light bulb moment. So uh, it's important to have uh, a, a listening uh, um, and effective um, and honest uh, leadership because um, the choices we make today uh, will define our tomorrow. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Naz. And um, Ingolf, um, just from your perspective, final words, thoughts on the session that we've just had, some of the wisdom that's been shared um, what do you see for the future? Sustainable Development Goals, 2030 Agenda, will we reach our targets? <laughs> well, I would wish, I mean, because as the, the SDGs, uh, if done right, and I know they are for sure as everything in uh, with humans, uh, they are also misused often, uh, but if done right, they're uh, they great, a great thing and we need to um, stick to it and try to still reach the uh, reach the goals, even if tough. Um, I like, I liked, I liked so much the inputs, you know, it's like the, the local solutions that, uh, that we need to, where we can use, uh, or let's say make worldwide impact by using local solutions is a great thing. Working together, which is of course a part of the SDGs. Um, this is all excellent. Uh, we have to, in the future, I think the ask the question why more often, um, uh, don't let the market decide uh, what we need or let only the market decide what we need. Let the experts decide um, and, uh, and then maybe let the market decide how we do it, but uh, not, uh, not what we actually need. And, and bring education to everyone or to as many people as possible. This is what our mission is and what we are working on every day. And, um, and use valuable music um, to make our lives better and uh, people healthier. Thanks, Ingolf. I mean, this is such a, it's quite profound, actually, that we can talk about such opportunities in this time of, shall we say, crisis. And, and I think we're, we're led to believe we are in a crisis situation when actually there is huge and enormous opportunities out there. Um, and I think it is important for people to be open minded and, and to embrace these opportunities that come our way. Um, James, uh, final words from yourself um, in terms of, you know, the future of social prescribing, uh, the role it can play in implementing the 17 SDGs and, um, and, and any final words of wisdom for those uh, who's joined this session today. Thank you, Gareth. I, I, I think, you know, COVID-19 has 
exposed um, the vulnerabilities of healthcare systems um, across the world um, and the um, vulnerabilities of individuals and communities as well in terms of their, their own health and well-being. Um, but it's also demonstrated the might of healthcare systems and professionals and communities um, at, at the same time and been astonishing at how those communities have, have responded. Um, I think um, for me, um, the most important thing going forward um, is what Dr. Mwande was saying in relation to um, leadership and uh, partnerships. I think we've got to have an openness to learn um, and we've got to have an openness to learn from areas and sectors that we perhaps haven't been open to listen to in, in, the, in the past. And I think we've got to have a willingness to work together in a, in a very, very different and innovative way. And, and that's why we formed the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. Um, that's why Gareth and I are passionate about that opportunity to, to bring countries and individuals together across sectors to have this conversation uh, around how we can achieve those sustainable development goals and, and how we can work together in new partnerships. And I think that could be a really positive thing to come out of what has been such a challenging um, 15, 16 months for the whole world um, and uh, really passionate about making that happen. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And, and also, it's if you just come back to the why, you know, everything has to start with why. And I think everyone on this panel here, Ingolf, Dr. Moanda, James, you know, we're passionate about making a difference. We, we, we're involved in the SDGs because we want to make a difference and we want to help people. And um, that's why, you know, I was drawn into the health sector. It's because you want to help and make a difference. You want to help your, you know, people who are in need, the most vulnerable in our society. It's a measure of any, you know, shall we say modern economy is how well you look after the most vulnerable in our society. So these are the challenges we face, but there are big opportunities ahead. Um, I just want to thank the World Health Summit for inviting us to host this session. Um, I hope it's been informative. If you have any questions, you can contact us online. Um, you can contact James at the National Academy of Social Prescribing.com. Uh, Tuada is available.com. And Ingolf Erdner, you can find across social media platforms and ourselves at WIS.UK. Um, we'll close this session. I hope you've enjoyed it. And from myself and the panel, we just want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, we're extremely grateful for the time. I'm extremely grateful to James, Dr. Moanda and Inga for giving their precious time up to share these words of wisdom with everyone today. And then um, we'll close this session, Moses. So thanks very much, everyone. And um, it's been a fantastic opportunity to share these uh, thoughts with you today. Bye. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.